<clears throat> Please, if you will, turn in your Bibles to Psalm 59. Psalm 59 is our scripture reading today. And then our sermon passage is taken from 1 Samuel chapter 19, verses 8 to 24. So Psalm 59, verses 1 to 10 is our scripture reading. 1 Samuel 19, verses 8 to 24 is our sermon passage. Ordinarily, I don't read uh, the, sometimes there are these uh, historical notes, historical inscriptions uh, at the beginning of a psalm. They're, they're not divinely inspired words, and yet there are occasions in, in the Psalter where uh, you have a, this historical note that tells you the reason why or the context in which a psalm was written. And these, this is one of the psalms uh, for which that is the case, Psalm 59. And so I wanted to read this to you, to the choir of master, according to Do Not Destroy, a miktam of David, when Saul sent men to watch his house in order to kill him. This psalm was written uh, on the occasion of what takes place in our passage this morning in 1 Samuel 19. And so I thought it was a fitting, uh, a fitting psalm to read. It's a prayer of David. It's, of course, a prayer for many of us. It's a fitting prayer for us to read or to sing. And so this is, uh, this is a psalm that was written on the very occasion uh, when Saul sent these messengers to David's house to watch, uh, to watch him and ultimately to kill him. Psalm 59, verses 1 to 10 is our scripture reading. 1 Samuel 19, verses 8 to 24 is our sermon passage. This is the word of God. Please give to it your full attention. Deliver me from my enemies, O oh my God. Protect me from those who rise up against me. Deliver me from those who work evil and save me from bloodthirsty men. For behold, they lie in wait for my life. Fierce men stir up strife against me. For no transgression of, or sin of mine, O Lord, for no fault of mine, they run and make ready. Awake, come to meet me and see. You, Lord God of hosts, are God of Israel. Rouse yourself to punish all the nations. Spare none of those who treacherous, treacherously plot evil. Each evening they come back howling like dogs and prowling about the city. There they are bellowing with their mouths, with swords in their lips, for who, they think, will hear us? But you, O Lord, laugh at them. You hold all the nations in derision. O my strength, I will watch for you, for you, O God, are my fortress. My God, in his steadfast love, will meet me. God will let me look in triumph on my enemies. Now, turning to 1 Samuel Chapter 19, beginning at verse 8 and reading through the end of the chapter. And there was war again. And David went out and fought with the Philistines and struck them with a great blow so that they fled before him. Then a harmful spirit from the Lord came upon Saul as he sat in his house with his spear in his hand. And David was playing the lyre. And Saul sought to pin David to the wall with the spear, but he eluded Saul so that he struck the spear into the wall. And David fled escaped that night. Saul sent messengers to David's house to watch him that he might kill him in the morning. But Michal, David's wife, told him, if you do not escape with your life tonight, tomorrow you will be killed. So Michal let David down through the window and he fled away and escaped. Michal took an image and laid it on the bed and put a pillow of goat's hair at its head and covered it with the clothes. And when Saul sent messengers to take David, she said, he is sick. Then Saul sent the messengers to see David, saying, Bring him up to me in the bed, that I may kill him. And when the messengers came in, behold, the image was in the bed, with the pillow of goat's hair at its head. Saul said to Michal, Why have you deceived me thus, and let my enemy go, so that he has escaped? And Michal answered Saul, He said to me, Let me go, why should I kill you? Now David fled and escaped, and he came to Samuel at Ramah, and told him all that Saul had done to him. And he and Samuel went and lived at Nioth. And it was told to Saul, Behold, David is at Nioth in Ramah. Then Saul sent messengers to take David. And when they saw the company of the prophets prophesying, and Samuel standing his head over them, the Spirit of God came upon the messengers of Saul, and they also prophesied. And when it was told Saul, he sent other messengers, and they also prophesied. And Saul sent messengers again the third time, and they also prophesied. 
Then he himself went to Ramah and came to the great well that is in Saku. And he asked, Where are Samuel and David? And one said, Behold, they are at Nioth and Ramah. And he went there to Nioth and Ramah. And the Spirit of God came upon him also. And as he went, he prophesied until he came to Nioth and Ramah. And he too stripped off his clothes. And he too prophesied before Samuel and lay naked all that day and all that night. Thus it is said, Is Saul also among the prophets? This ends the reading of God's most holy and inspired, inerrant and infallible word. Let us pray. Our gracious God, we thank you again and again for what your word teaches us, not about David, not about Saul, not about Samuel, not about McCall, not about any other character in the Bible save you and you alone, O God. We're thankful for what it teaches about you. You, O Lord, are the primary person, the primary figure, the primary character in your word. So that it is primarily a revelation of yourself to us. And we are thankful, dear Lord, that you've revealed yourself to us, that you've made yourself known to us. We're thankful for the fact that your spirit makes us able to know you through your word. And that he joins with your word as it's read and as it's preached to make us more and more like our Savior, Jesus Christ. Lord, please bless us now as the word is preached. Help us to hear, give us understanding, help us to be attentive. Help us, O Lord, to see this as part of our duty in worshiping you. And so, O Lord, may we glorify you, the preaching and the hearing of your word. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Now you'll remember from a couple of weeks back that in the previous passage in 1 Samuel 19, we saw how God used Jonathan to intercede for David in order to keep Saul from carrying out his plan to kill David. Now we could have taken all of chapter 19 together. That would have been fine. Uh, many commentaries, uh, commentators deal with uh, the entire chapter as, as, one, uh, as one thing, one ordeal in a sense. And yet, I think for, for the sake of, of all of us, it was good to divide it up in the way that we did. And yet, what chapter 19 does for us is it shows us again and again how the Lord cares for his people, how he delivers his people, how he protects and defends his people. You remember that Jonathan succeeded for a time in, in helping uh, David to, uh, to uh, receive rest from Saul's wrath. Um, he convinced his father not to kill David. Back in verse 6 of chapter 19, Saul swore, As the Lord lives, he shall not be put to death. Now, if you were already familiar with 1 Samuel, and even if you just heard the rest of chapter 19 for the first time this morning, you know that Saul, obviously, didn't keep this promise that he made to Jonathan. Now, in some ways, our passage serves to reiterate what the first seven verses of chapter 19 teaches, that God protects his people. But taking the, the entirety of this chapter together, we're shown the variety of ways, or, or a variety of ways, in which the Lord does this, in which the Lord defends his people. The Lord has all kinds of, of resources, tools, weapons at his hands, in his hands in order to defend his people. And so as we saw in the first seven verses, God used Jonathan to protect David. In verses 9 and 10, David is able to evade the spear that Saul threw at him. And so we could say God used David to help protect himself. And then God uses David's wife, Michal, who also happens to be Saul's daughter to protect David. And finally, God once again defends David directly by causing all of those who came to kill David, including Saul himself, to break into paroxysms of prophecy, which prevented them from doing David any harm. This is the way. These are some of the ways, we should say, that God defends his people. And so to ask you to think about this, to, to hold this in front of you as we work our way through the sermon today, God shows himself to be our true king by defending us and restraining all his and our enemies. Let me say that one more time. God shows himself to be our true king by defending us and restraining all his and our enemies. Now, some of you 
uh, you may detect a, a note of the catechism in there. And if you do, you're right, it is. Almost taken word for word from the shorter catechism. The sermon is divided into three sections. The first, victory and envy. The second, intrigue and artifice. And the third, obst obstinance and omnipotence. So again, victory and envy, that's the first section. The second, intrigue and artifice. And the third, obstinance and omnipotence. So let's look at the first section now, victory and envy. Now, one of the things that we don't know, it's difficult to tell, um, just because verses 7 and 8 are immediately uh, uh, put together in chapter 19, doesn't necessarily mean that the events that happen in verses 8 and following uh, are immediately following uh, what takes place in verse 7. Uh, but however long it was, it was long enough for Saul to once again be filled with jealousy because of David's victories in battle. We read in verse 7 that David was in Saul's presence as before. He was playing his lyre, we read in our passage. And he continued to fight Israel's enemies, which at this time uh, period primarily meant the Philistines. And verse 8 says that once again there was a war. And David, acting as a king should, even though he wasn't yet technically the king, he'd been, or, uh, 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 he'd been anointed as king but not installed as king, he went out and fought against and defeated the Philistines. There's no mention of Saul doing this, though as king, Saul should have been at the head. He should have been at the front of his army. And we read that David struck them with such a great blow that the enemy fled from before him. Now notice that the author here of 1 Samuel doesn't give any credit to anyone else but David. Uh, David, we have to say, as great a warrior as he was, and most certainly he was, there's no doubt, uh, this, this man was, was amazing in battle. But as great as he was, he could not do what is described in verse 8 alone. He could not rout the entire, or at least even a part of the Philistine army by himself. And so the, the author gives no credit to anyone else besides David, but this undoubtedly reflects the public's perception of the victories over the Philistines. The people of Israel are giving David uh, credit. And so David is in the spotlight the public's attention is directed at David, and this attention directed at David sent Saul flying into a fit of envy. He is jealous. He's angry. But then verse 9 explicitly says that this is a harmful spirit from the Lord that came upon Saul. Now, it seems like about a year ago, but we first encountered this phrase as it relates to Saul back in chapter six, 16, verse 14. It was only three chapters ago. It was just back in June, believe it or not. But it seems like sometime in 2019 when we were that far back. And we read this. Now the spirit of the Lord departed from Saul, and a harmful spirit from the Lord tormented him. How do we understand what verse 9 in our passage is saying? How did we understand what, what verse 14 of chapter 16 was saying? Well, we know that God is not the author of evil. We know that. And we can understand this to a limited degree as God giving Saul over, possibly only for a time, to manifold temptations and the corruption of his own heart to chasten him from his former sin, for his former sins. Verse 9 shows that the Spirit from the Lord is active in tormenting Saul. And so it may be something akin to, something akin to, I don't know that it's identical, but when we think about the first chapter of the book of Job, and how Satan, he's been roaming the earth, he's been going to and fro, that's the language. It's the language of, of Satan looking for someone to accuse. And, and we read what happens next and we don't fully understand it, but God says, have you considered my servant Job? Blameless and upright, a fear of God. No one is as righteous as he is. Now, if we were Job, we would not want that kind of attention being brought to us. We want to keep our heads down. We don't want a target on our backs. We want to just go about our lives and, and, and stay out of uh, any attention uh, of the devil. We don't want him coming after us. But there may be something uh, akin to that about what is going on here. And so it's difficult to know whether this is some type of, of literal spirit, like a demon, or whether it's like a malignant emotional or mental state or disposition. But it certainly seems like Saul becomes increasingly unstable. 
He's just made this promise to his son sometime prior to what happens in uh, verses 8 and 9. And now he's trying to kill David yet again. Whatever it is, it came from God to Saul. And this is simply stating the truth that while God is not the author of evil, all things, whether good or injurious to us, happen according to his perfect plan. Nothing is outside of his control. Not even evil. And brothers and sisters, you do not want it in any other way. If evil is outside of God's control, then that means that evil is the equal of God. And now we're dealing with dualism, which is not Christianity. God indeed is sovereign even over evil, even though he is not the author of evil. And so this is the spirit, the, the disposition that David formerly would soothe by playing his lyre. But that no longer seems to work with Saul. David is the primary target of Saul's wrath. And Saul tries to make David a literal target of his wrath. Verse 10 says, And Saul sought to pin David to the wall with the spear, but he, that is David, eluded Saul so that he struck the spear into the wall, and David fled, fled rather, and escaped that night. Now, Saul was the living embodiment of what is written about in James chapter 1, verses 4, chapter 4, verses 1 and 2. What causes quarrels and what causes fights among you? Is it not this, that your passions are at war with you? You desire and you do not have, so you murder. You covet and cannot obtain, so you fight and quarrel. Saul's jealousy of the acclaim that David was receiving and whatever madness Saul was dealing with, whatever form you want to understand that, it drove him into this murderous rage. Saul wanted the adulation that David was getting, and he thought as king that he was entitled to it, that it belonged to him alone, and he was willing to murder David because of this. In this instance, David was able to escape, but as we'll see, David was not always able to defend himself. David needed the help of others. And this takes us to the next section of the sermon, Intrigue and Artifice. Now, we read in verse 10 that David fled and escaped that night. And the next few verses are going to tell us how he did that. How, how it came about that he was able to escape from Saul's wrath, from uh, his messengers that he sent out. And so David escaped Saul's spear, but he wasn't out of danger yet. Verse 11 says that Saul sent messengers to David's house to watch him so that Saul might kill him in the morning. And again, remember what we read from Psalm 59. This is the, the, the event uh, that caused David to write that. McCall warned David that he wasn't safe and he told him that he needed to escape that night. Apparently, McCall is, is aware of the palace intrigue that is taking place within her own house, within her own household. She's a member of the royal family. She is a princess, as it were. And her loyalties here are not to her father, but to her husband. And so she warns David. She tells him he has to get out of there. And she lets David down through the window, and he fled. It's almost here. Just a little bit like the reversal of the way things usually work in a Disney princess movie, isn't it? It's McCall who is, in a sense, rescuing David. She's providing for him the means of escape, the way to get away from her murderous father. And after David was gone, verse 13 says that McCall made it look like David was asleep in bed by putting an image in the bed and covering it. Now, the same Hebrew word is used in its plural form. What, what's used as image here, it's used in its plural form in Genesis chapter 31, verse 19, and it's translated there, household gods. There's no explanation given for why this image was in their house. But we can safely say here that it's now being put to good use. For whatever use it had been used before, now it's being put to good use. McCall is creating a ruse to fool her father's messengers to buy David more time to get away. And so when these messengers came to McCall, she told them that David was sick. She might have pointed through the door and said, see, he's laying there in bed. The messengers reported back to Saul. They go back. They say that David was sick in bed. And in verse 15, Saul commands them to bring the bed with David in it to him so that he can kill David. And when they came in this time, the second time, the messengers discovered that it was just an image. 
uh, it had a, there was a pillow of goat's hair at the head to, to make it look like David was there. It was covered with some form of, of bedclothes. And then at some point, Saul comes to David and McCall's house. And he asks McCall, his daughter, why have you deceived me thus and let my enemy go so that he has escaped? And to her first deception, this, this image that's made to look up like David, or made up to look like David in bed, she adds a second deception. And she says, he said to me, let me go. Why should I kill you? Now think about this for a moment. You remember back earlier, chapter 18, Saul had agreed to let David marry one of his daughters so that she might become a trap for David. First it was Merab, and then for whatever reason that didn't work out, Merab marries another man. Saul says, I'll let you marry my daughter Michal so that she could be a trap for David. Saul was confident that Michal was more loyal to him than to her husband. But what happens? Michal proves to be a trap for Saul, not for David. A good trap always has some kind of bait, a lure, to draw the intended quarry in. The lure was the image and pillow in bed made up to look like David. The prey was Saul. And the trap itself turned out to be McCall, his daughter. Proverbs 28 verse 10 says, Whoever misleads the upright into an evil way will fall into his own pit, but the blameless will have a goodly inheritance. Saul has just fallen into the pit that he dug for David at the hands of his own daughter. Saul has lost out in the loyalty department with two of his children, first Jonathan and now McCall. Now, the Bible makes no comment here about whether McCall was justified in what she did. I think we all probably, we could all agree that the ruse that she created there with this image being in bed made to look like, it sounds like something out of a movie, right? Uh, Ferris Bueller, I think, or, or the Harry Potter series. Uh, there's something in the bed. It's made to look like uh, David and, and fool uh, the messengers. But then she lies. Most of us could be okay, I think, comfortable with, with the ruse, the deception. But then she goes further. There's no comment. Uh, there's a question as to whether when we're trying to save the life of another human being, if it's, if it's actually a violation of, in this case, the ninth commandment to bear false witness in order to save the life of another. There's a question about that. There's a disagreement among theologians and scholars about whether in order to uh, preserve or keep the fifth, uh, I'm sorry, the sixth commandment, you can, you can break the, the ninth commandment. Some would argue that, that it's not a violation of the ninth commandment uh, in that particular case because it's an unlawful order. We're not going to get into all of that. But I think it's important to say this, that it does serve her willingness to lie in the way that she did. To say that David had threatened her. I think we'd say this, we're not judging her necessarily for that lying but it does seem to foreshadow what will happen in 2 Samuel chapter 6, where we read that in verse 16, as the ark of the Lord came into the city, Michal, the daughter of Saul. And note in our passage, she's not referred to as the daughter of Saul. She's the wife of David in our passage. In, in 2 Samuel chapter 6, Michal, the daughter of Saul, looked out the window and saw King David, and she despised him in her heart. Whether or not, that was already being manifested in the heart of McCall in our chapter in 1 Samuel. It at least seems to be to serve as a foreshadowing of what's going to happen later. That McCall would say this about her husband and then later on she despises him and ridicules him. But here in the competing loyalties that she had for David and her father, her loyalty to her father would, would ultimately, it loses here but ultimately would win out. Now we move to the third point in the sermon, obstinance and omnipotence. Verse 18 says, Now David fled and escaped, and he came to Samuel at Ramah and told him all that Saul had done to him, and he and Samuel went and lived at Nioth. David got away, and he went to the one person he was confident could protect him from Saul. Now verse 19 makes it clear that Nioth is, is still in this territory known as Ramah, there appears to be a city named Ramah and perhaps a wider region named Ramah as well. Nioth is in Ramah, but it's in a different location for, from where David went to meet Samuel in verse 18. And verse 18 says that they went and they lived there at Nioth. 
And once again, it's difficult to know for how long they were there, but eventually word reached Saul that David was hiding out there. And in verse 20, Saul once again sent messengers to take David. But here something very interesting happens. Apparently, Nioth was the home office of a company of prophets, as verse 20 puts it. And on the day that these messengers got to Nioth, Samuel was standing as the head of the prophets, and they were prophesying. Now, here's where I think it's worth noting. I don't want to make too big of a deal of this, but it's worth noting that the word that's translated messenger here is translated in other places in the Old Testament, not exclusively, but in other places in the Old Testament as angel. An angel in its proper, proper sense is a spiritual being who comes bearing a message from God. Now, these messengers were not from God. They were from Saul. They were, they were simply human messengers. And in a sense, they were messengers in name only. They came as messengers of death, angels of death, we might say. But it is ironic then, if you think about this, this that after the Spirit of God came upon these messengers from Saul, they were in a sense living up to the broader Old Testament meaning of the word. They were prophesying. They were bearing a message from God. They were doing so against their will. They were doing so not because they were even cognizant of it, but because God, in his sovereignty, in his omnipotence over them, caused them to do it. And so this, this rendered the messengers incapable of carrying out the mission that Saul had given to them. And so when Saul found out in verse 21, it says that he sent other messengers. And when they get there to Nioth, they too prophesied. They're rendered incapable. And so he sent a third group of messengers. And the same thing happened. Each of these messengers from Saul actually become messengers from God. They're prophesying, and, and prophesying here means that they are, they are speaking under the power of the Holy Spirit. They're speaking the word of God. We don't know what they were saying, but they were doing this along with Samuel. And then Saul decided that if it was going to get done, he was going to have to be the one to do it. Verse 22 says that he himself went to Ramah. And when he arrived at this great well in Saku, he asked where Samuel and David were. And so someone told them that they were in Nioth. Saul is on the march. And he went to Nioth. And verse 23 says that the Spirit of God came upon him. And he prophesied until he came to Nioth and Ramah. And verse 24 says that he too stripped off his clothes and prophesied before Samuel and lay naked all that day and night. And thus the people said, is Saul also among the prophets? What this means is that all of those other messengers, as they approached Nioth, as they approached Samuel, and they're all there, this company of prophets, that they begin to prophesy, they essentially lose their right minds, they, they lose control of what they are doing, they strip down bare naked and lay and are incapable of doing what Saul had wanted them to do. Now you remember that Saul had previously prophesied back in chapter 10. In verse 11, the same question after Saul had prophesied, the same question is asked of him, is Saul also among the, pro among the prophets? But the contrast between chapters 10 and, ch and 19 could not be more stark. In chapter 10, Saul had just been anointed king. And verse 9 of chapter 10, 10 says that, that Saul had given Saul, God had given Saul a new heart. And when he encountered a group of prophets, he began to prophesy with them. In chapter 19, Saul has lost, in a sense, the glory of the Lord. The light has gone out. The spirit has departed from Saul. And he's in a murderous rage. And every attempt that has been made to kill David has failed. The assassins that he has sent have just been immobilized. So Saul takes matters into his own hands, and he is rendered useless by the power of God. He's rendered useless, but he's also brought low. He is humbled. There isn't anything more helpless looking than a naked baby, and that is essentially what Saul and his messengers have been reduced to. You can imagine that Saul went out in, in whatever battle gear a king would lead his army into battle with. That's what he went out in. With his sword, perhaps a shield, perhaps his chain mail that he offered to David when David was going to fight against Goliath. And here he is, out in the middle of the country, buck naked, helpless, defenseless, powerless to do anything. God has rendered him incapable. 
Saul's obstinacy met its match against God's omnipotence. He is like the nations that rage and shake their fists at God and are angry. But there's nothing that those nations can do about it. Now bear in mind here that David or one of Israel's enemies could have slaughtered Saul and his messengers there on the spot. Because in his defense of David, God had left Saul and his men utterly defenseless. I think Dale Davis in his commentary on 1 Samuel in this chapter, if you've, if you've got his commentary on 1 Samuel, it's very helpful. He offers some good precautions for us as we seek to apply this passage to ourselves. It's fitting, it's proper. We ought to read the Bible and see what kind of implications that we can take from particular passages, how we can apply these passages to ourselves. But, but there are some precautions that we ought to take. And so Dale Davis, he writes... Uh, having to do with this passage, how much of David's experience can I write over into my life? Can I simply say that what God has done for David, he'll do for me? I cannot do that for myself. We have to be careful. David held a very special position in God's covenantal relationship with God's people. He was the king over Israel. He was the deliverer over Israel. He uh, was the first David Uh, in relation to the second David who was to come, the the, the son of David, the greater son. And so we have to be careful about this. We we don't want to just do a one-to-one equation. Well, as God protected David, so he will protect me. This passage doesn't teach you and me that God will deliver us from every type of physical harm that might come our way. But, As Dale Davis says, when he states this general principle of Davidic protection, it can be claimed by the believer, this general uh, principle. And so he writes, I can be confident that God will keep me until whatever he has ordained for me to be or to do is accomplished. Let me say that one more time. I think that's that's a helpful thing for us to keep in mind. I can be confident that God will keep me until whatever he has ordained for me to be or to do is accomplished. God has the very hairs on your and my heads numbered. He knows the exact number of breaths that we will take in our lives, the number of heartbeats. He knows our days. He has ordained them. And he has ordained you and me to be here for a purpose. And whatever that purpose is, we will live until that purpose is complete. And so we can say in a general way that just as God defended David by restraining David's and God's enemies, so God will defend us. Now that doesn't mean that that nothing bad will ever happen to us. Many very bad things happen to David. But of course David had special protection protection from God because David was the anointed king of Israel. But we can say that nothing of ultimate harm can befall us. Because for the one who believes in Jesus Christ, even death, which is the ultimate harm, it does not harm us in an ultimate sense. Death is our enemy, just as 1 Corinthians 15 says. But it can't hurt the one who believes in Jesus Christ. Death hurts those who don't believe in Jesus Christ. And so we we are called to make provisions for our own defense. We we saw that in our passage as David evaded the spear thrown by God. We, We should not be walking around witless in this fallen world. We need to be aware of what's going on around us. And that's just not to physical threats, but to spiritual threats which are indeed our the main threat that, that we and our, our covenant community here, the main threats we face are spiritual, not physical. And we need to be aware of that. We need to be on the defense. We need to be looking out for those things that, which can harm us spiritually as well as physically. David's prayer in Psalm 59, deliver me from my enemies, O God, protect me from those who rise up against me. That was part of David taking responsibility. He called upon his true defender to protect him. So, brothers and sisters, pray regularly for yourselves and for your families and for your church. Pray regularly, children, for your moms and dads, for your grandparents, 
Pray regularly, uh, brothers and sisters in Christ, for the little ones in this church, whether they belong to you or not. We need to pray that our defender would protect us. And so one of those ways that God rules over and defends us is by using us, ourselves, we ourselves, as a means of defense for ourselves and for those we love. But each of us is not a one-man army. Sorry, those of you who are affiliated with the army. When they, I don't know if they still use the slogan, an army of one, but it always, it always as a Marine, drove me a little bit crazy. I'm sorry. An army of one. No, I'm sorry. We're not. We're not one-man army. Armies. We aren't Rambo. Get it out of your heads if you think you are. We cannot come close to perfectly protecting and defending ourselves. And what we need to keep in mind is that God is at all times defending you and me from harm. Just as he used McCall, just as uh, he used Jonathan, just as God came in and directly intervened himself when he caused all of these enemies of David to, to, to become helpless as they were prophesying. He uses other people to protect us. And even on occasion, he, he may even directly intervene for us. You can trust that God will not suffer the loss of even one of his children. Now, this doesn't mean that you'll never die, though, though some of us here may, God willing, be alive when Christ Jesus returns. This does not mean that you will absolutely never die physically. It does mean that if you believe in Jesus Christ, you will never suffer spiritual death. You will never suffer the eternal pains of hell and torment that are God's wrath against sinners if you believe in Jesus Christ. And if you believe in Jesus Christ, then that last, that last enemy, death, will itself be destroyed. It will be swallowed up. We can cry out, where, O oh death, is your sting? Where is your victory? Because we know that Christ Jesus already has been victorious over it, and we long, we, we long for the day when death will indeed be no more. Let us pray. Our gracious God, we thank you that you are our defender and our protector, that you look after us that you are watching over us. We pray, Lord, that you would help us to trust in you. We pray, Lord, that we would be responsible children of the Most High King. We pray that we wouldn't stumble about in some sort of stupor in this life, doing potential damage to ourselves and others. We pray that we would be spiritually aware as well as physically aware of the dangers that are around. But we pray, dear Lord, that we would not be anxious, but instead, Lord, that we would trust in you, knowing that you protect us, that you defend us, that you are restraining all of your and our enemies, and so that we don't need to worry. We don't need to tremble before the world or our own flesh or the devil. We're thankful, dear Lord, that you have brought us to a point where we can tremble in reverence and awe and in childlike faith before you, our Heavenly Father. We're grateful to you, O Lord, for this, and we pray this all in Christ's name. Amen.